Welcome everybody to our last um, AAUP ASSC event of the 2014-2015 year. Thanks for coming everyone. Uh, my name is Monique Oldfield and I have had the privilege to serve as uh, co-chair and chair of the uh, ASSC for the past two years. So as this is our final event, um, I would like to first publicly thank the remainder of the ASSC committee who has worked very hard to bring eight events um, to the academic staff here during this, during this year. Uh, first, uh, Cheryl White, right here. She has been co-chair and will be chair next year. So this is someone that we will be hearing a lot more from. <laughs> And she's also now Dr. Cheryl yes. <laughs> A month ago, Cheryl defended her uh, dissertation and has been awarded her PhD from Wayne State. Demisha uh, Donahue here has been serving as secretary. And then we have um, two members at large, Marianka Holloway. Here? Yeah. And Linda Seats, who is not, not here yet. Uh, also, I'd like to also publicly thank uh, Michelle Fecto, our AAUP Executive Director, <laughs> and uh, Tammy Force, our Executive Assistant. <laughs> so, really, together, um, as part of the AAUP and ASSC, we work to bring events like this, such as the current promotion which is really about our continued success as a group, but also for you as individuals. So look around. These are the people that you can turn to for that support for your continued success. And we'll be hearing some important words on how we all prepare you for that journey. But we always do this. We gather together. We go around and introduce ourselves, remind us what makes us uh, academic staff and the different roles that we play. So... Um, Cheryl White, we know your name, but tell us, remind us where you are from. Uh, I am an Extension Program Coordinator in Educational Outreach. I'm Heather Sandlin. I'm an Academic Services Officer in the College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences. I'm Gail McCready. I'm an Academic Advisor in the Department of History. I'm Kristen Chinnery. I'm an Archivist at the Ruther Library and Chair of the AAUP Council. Michael Samson, Law Library.
specialize in graduate programs on business and school business. I'm Carla Larosa, acting advisor in DOSO and the Korean and School Leader for Hi, everybody. I'm Helen Wilson. I'm academic advisor in University Advising Center, and I'm also treasurer AAUPA. Stacey Moser, academic advisor in Public Sociology. Tiana Toto, academic advisor in Western Learning. Julie Katz, academic advisor in School of Business. And Carly Wolfram, academic advisor in School of Business. Yes, again, thanks for doing that, everybody. It's so nice to see people who come from a little farther away, from pharmacy and social work and various other areas, you know, like outreach around the campus that come here for this uh, really good event. We also have distributed a uh, flyer, a nomination form, to, for you to think about um, nominating yourself to serve on the ASSC with Cheryl next year. Uh, I always enjoyed attending these kind of events and thought to myself that's kind of how I want to get involved to continue with their planning and the other things that the ASSC does. So uh, if you've gotten this far, you may be a good candidate to submit your name for the um, co-chair, secretary, or the member of large position. So um, you know, this information will also be distributed through some other channels as well besides this meeting. Just my emails. Sure. Um, ASSC co-chair serves under with the chair one year and then becomes the chair next year. That's why there's no nomination for chair here. And also the chair serves on the executive board. So again, I'm very happy to have this uh, wonderful panel here that Cheryl has uh, put together and will be for us. So uh, take it away, Cheryl. Thank you, Monique. Again, thank you everyone who has come today. Uh, one of the reasons why we strategically placed this uh, presentation at the end of the academic year is because for those of you who may be considering going up for promotion the next academic year, the 2016-2017, over the summer is the time to start getting your documents together. So I have purposely selected the panelists based on their experience in different pieces of the promotion process. Heather Sandlin, again, uh, she works in the uh, pharmacy and allied health. She will be providing a perspective of preparing a promotion because she just submitted her packet this academic year. Gail McCready has served on the department of division level of the promotion and tenure committee. And then Kristen Chenery has served on the university promotion and tenure committee. So briefly, other than what they've already stated about themselves, I'm just going to give a brief introduction. First, Heather, again, she is an academic services officer too at Wayne State University. She's been working in the Eugene Applebaum College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences since January 2009. Uh, she has her Master's of Arts degree in Dispute Resolution from Wayne State University and is in the process of earning her Master of Arts degree in Urban Planning, which she hopes to complete this year. So welcome, Heather. Thank you. Gail McCready is an academic advisor, too, in the Department of History. She has been with Wayne State University and the Department of History in a variety of roles for the last 29 years. Hers is truly a Wayne State story. She was a first-generation student as an undergraduate before returning after graduate school to serve the students like herself. Gail has served on a myriad salary and P and T promotion and tenure committees at both the college and the university levels. Again, thank you, Gail. And Kristen Chinnery is the reference archivist at the Walter P. Ruther Library, where she is responsible for managing all aspects of manuscript reference services. She has worked at Wayne State University for 12 years. Kristen received a Master of Arts in History, a Master of Library and Information Science, and also has an archival administrative certificate from Wayne State University. She earned her Bachelor of Arts degree in History from Adrian College. Kristen is the immediate past president of the Michigan Archival Association and serves on the steering committee of the Regional Archival Association 
Consortium, which is an affiliate of the Society of American Archivists. Kristen serves Wayne State University as the chair of the AAUP AFT Council. She is a member of the AAUP AFT Executive Board, Academic Staff Mentoring Committee, and Academic Staff Promotion and Tenure Committee. So let's give a round of applause to all of our <laughs> Heather will be our first presenter, but also she will have to leave for another meeting earlier, so don't think she doesn't like any of you all, but she does have another commitment. So I'll turn it over to Heather. Okay. Um, well, welcome. Um, when Cheryl asked, uh, approached me about doing this, um, she, you know, had mentioned, you know, since I was just recently, uh, this past year, put my packet together for promotion, would I be interested in serving? And, you know, I think that um, when I started at Wayne State uh, five and a half years ago, it was the first time that I was part of a union. So it was a big learning curve for me as far as learning the process. But I was fortunate in my unit to have a couple of individuals that sort of knew the process and kind of took me under their wing from the beginning. And I'm thankful for them. And so what I try to do is I try to do that for other individuals as well, whether it's within my college or outside of my college. So one thing I will, um, I do want to say is that, you know, a couple of years ago they started the mentor for academic staff which I think has been um, fantastic. I definitely think that there's more that we can do, but it's it's definitely a great start. So if you're not familiar with, with the mentor program, it is something that you can become a part of as being a mentor or a mentee, and I would highly encourage that. I've had um, definitely some positive experiences from that because, you know, <clears throat> We all don't know everything, you know, and, there, and, and we all still have questions. It's always a kind of an ongoing process with changes and things like that. Um, so I guess I'll just sort of um, talk briefly about preparing um, a promotion packet. I know the big question for myself was, do you do ESS first, do you do promotion first, or do you do both at the same time? And my situation was a little unique because I started out in a fractional position when I started here at Wayne State, and I was in that for a little over a year, and later out found out that that time didn't necessarily count. So that's why the, the steps for me were a little bit different. Um, but I did go up for ESS in 2012 because it's more of an internal college, and I knew I had the support from my college, so I felt like I had my bearings a little ready to do that first. But I don't think there's really any right or wrong way. I think you'll talk to people that have had all different kinds of experiences. So it's really just, I think it's kind of unique to where you are, um, the support of your administration, of your supervisors, the rest of the college, um, other people um, in your unit. You know, So you just kind of have to feel it out a little bit. But definitely, you know, feel free, if, you know, some of you are the only you know, staff person in your area, to reach out. I think everyone... Um, that I've ever approached has been more than willing to share their experiences and, and have good insight. Um, so one of the things I'll talk about first is um, is your professional record. Um, and I was fortunate from the beginning to have someone kind of show me what the record is, what it means, sort of how to organize it, what to include, what not to include from the beginning. And I think that if you can do that from the beginning, you know, the sooner you start working on that, the better. And obviously it is a work in progress and it's something that you're constantly sort of updating, especially now with, with our merit. You know, it is something you have to do on a yearly basis. Even if you do have ESS, you still have to go through the merit process. So it is a good way to sort of keep yourself in check with keeping that updated. And it is broken down into different areas, but what I do know anyone else can step in with this, is that you know when you're going up for promotion, it really is about your job performance. And all of us have fact, you know, all of us do, you know, we have our job, and then we have, you know, service, and then we have, you know, professional development, scholarly achievement, which for a lot of staff isn't really applicable like it is for faculty. But I think that's really what you have to kind of, you know, focus on um, and what you want to highlight and talk about in, in your strengths. And each of you, you know, everyone has factors in their college, and you also have um, factors for different levels. I'm currently, I was hired in as an a um, academic services officer, too, because of my educational background when I was hired at Wayne State. 
So I was, go I was, you know, my packet was going from a two to a three, so I had to look at what the factors were. Fortunately, I will say I had the benefit of serving on the committee that Kristen's going to talk about last year. So I actually served on a promotion committee the year before I submitted my packet for promotion, which was great because I knew from being in that experience exactly what the process was, what they looked for, how your you know packet is reviewed. So I would highly recommend um, trying to get involved in that if you can. And you don't, you know, anyone can can become a part of that process. So anyway, that was great to be able to do that, to kind of learn, you know, what I needed to do, make sure I had all of my, you know, I's dotted, my T's crossed, and also to have someone in my unit that actually went up for a promotion the year before, so like they just went through the process and were successful at it. So that was um, definitely, you know, beneficial. Um, another thing that I want to talk about is um, I talked about mentors. Um, when you go up for promotion, obviously one of the things you want to do is you want to talk to your college and make sure that you have the support of your college um, because that's really important because you're going to need that. And, um, and then you want to start to think about one of the things I can say that I did from the beginning is like somebody mentioned like, oh, we're so glad to have people come over here from pharmacy. <laughs> like because we are a little removed physically. Um, at least in the Applebaum building from main campus, you know, but uh, obviously there's a lot of things that take place on main campus. So I always tried to sort of make, make sure that I wasn't going to be in a silo, that I was going to be connected to other things going on at the university. So from the beginning, you know, I started, you know, asking others about things that I could become involved in, committees. Um, I've been a member of uh, CO. SW since basically from the time I started here at Wayne State for the Career Development Committee, which is a committee not just for academic <coughs> staff. Um, administrators are part of that committee. I mean, there's all different um, people, um, students. You know, we have events that we schedule that are open to not only staff but faculty and students as well. So that's been a really great experience. Um, then I. Uh, I also am grateful because I do have staff in my college that sort of encourage me to become involved in things like Academic Senate, which, you know, being on the Academic Senate, not only being on the Academic Senate, but being on the Academic Senate Budget Committee has been definitely a learning experience because it learns how this, what's going on at Wayne State as a whole, and not just how we fit in, in, in the College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences, but how we fit into the bigger picture and, like, what's going on and, you know, just what things are coming down the road for Wayne State. So it just starts to make you think a little more holistically. Because it is easy to sort of get stuck in, but it also gives you the opportunity to network and meet people that are outside of your college. And that's one of the things that you want to do because when it gets time to come up for a promotion, you need to develop a list of evaluators. And you need to provide a list of names and they want you to supply names that are outside of your college. So you know, I've met people like Cheryl along the way who um, got me involved in uh, MCPA, which is the Michigan College Personnel Association. Now I'm president-elect for that organization. You know, so it's just, you know, making these networks and meeting people and just becoming connected. Um, and that is important because, like I said, as far as, you know, providing a list of external evaluators, um, that will be definitely uh, beneficial for you. So, um Another thing is timelines. You know, you really want to go on. The provost website has everything laid out. There's templates out there. There's timelines out there to sort of tell you when, when to start getting your, you know, everything together. Um, thankfully, because I did ESS in 2012, I sort of kind of had done a packet before and, you know, had some materials in there already. Um, but, you know, promotion is a different process. So, you know, there's other things that you have to include. But also finding out within your college or your unit, um, typically there's somebody that um, could be assigned to assisting with getting your packet together because now everything is electronic. So, um, and that person also sort of, well, and at least in our college, that person also works with faculty too. So they're always having this, you know, timeline on the radar and, um, and they can, you know, if they're resourceful, they can really help you to keep everything on track and make sure you're getting everything submitted when you need to submit it, or at least getting it to them so that they can submit it by the deadline. So I have, um, so anyway, um, 
I have some samples. I don't know if you're interested, but I have, you know, I'm more than welcome to share my record with anyone. Um, also, one of the things that you have to do is you have to sort of write a letter to your supervisor, um, letting them know that your plan is to go up for promotion. And then basically what I did is I sort of coordinated mine with all of the factors that are considered for promotion. So, for instance, job performance. So I'm currently, you know, I've been doing da 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 And then this is, these are things that I've done to where I feel like I'm up to the next level. You know, so it's a lot of um, sort of categorizing it, making sure that you include the right content um, in the right sections. And I guess when it comes down to it, um, some advice that I could give to you is that when you're putting all of this together, especially for your record, you don't necessarily have to put everything in there, you know, you, you know, because then it's going to become lengthy and then each year you can sort of cut off, you know, things that are further away and further removed from the past, you know, and, and update it with more recent um, activities. So just make sure that you're selective with things that you include. And also keep in mind that the committee, and I have this from my own experience and, and Kristen will probably talk about this as well, they don't necessarily know what you do. So what you have to do is you have to be descriptive and de as detailed as possible about your job duties and performance. Because all of you know, many of us have similar titles, but we do completely different things. So just kind of keep that in mind. ESS probably is going to be a little bit different because that's more of an internal, so those people work with you more every day and know what your role is, although that may not necessarily always be true too, but um, assuming that they do. And then, you know, again, being promoted means that you're performing at a higher level for all factors, not just that you're doing your current job well. So, and also remember that promotions are not automatic. It is um, something that is um, reviewed by a peer committee along with the assistance of provost and um, associate provost. So, you know, just sort of um, remember those things as you're putting your packet together. I don't know if I need to, like, give you any visuals right now, um, but I would be more than happy to share those with anyone. Or... Yeah, exactly. Okay. So, um, I will say that I uh, did get a letter yesterday that did indicate that I was uh, selected for promotion to <laughs> I did. It was, you know, with the assistance of others, it worked. It worked, yeah. So, just thank you to anyone in here that was on the committee too for your support. Um, any quick yeah, questions? Just really quick, because you have to leave. So yeah. Does anyone have any just general questions? Yeah. So I'm here, and I don't go up for ESS for to my fifth year, mm -hmm. but I want to go up for promotion, and I can do that after my third year or the beginning of my third year. No. Yeah. No, that. One. Okay. You get in a fourth year. You have to have work in here for three years. Be in your position okay. for three years. And then you yeah. up so so you can go up before you go up for ESS, obviously. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I will say, and I don't know that this is common, but for ESS, you if you have to do it. So, like, the fifth year is the deadline, but I actually did mine sooner. But that was because I knew I had the support. But you know that would that, that would be something you'd have to kind of feel out with your with your dean or your associate dean or your chair or whoever you know whoever um, you know each college is is a little yeah. different. Yeah. Well, because for example, because yeah. I went up for promotion before I went up for ESS. Okay. Yeah. In, yes. Yeah. Clarification on the, the the three years when it starts because remember we all have different anniversary dates for our starting time. So if you think there's a three-year question, it is three years, but because the university promotion system is on a set schedule, yeah. it depends. It, that's another one that you, if you think you're, you're in there close, talk to somebody, talk to one of us at the union, and we can, we can help you look and see where you are, because there's not a cut and dry. If everybody started in September, then we could say that. But it, 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 I have seen over the years where it comes up as a question. Almost every year there's somebody who says, do I fall in it or not? Uh, so if you're, if you're not sure, ask. Don't assume that you are eligible. But that's not. Right. My motto is the only stupid question is the one that you don't ask. So mm -hmm. ask. Right. There's a question in the back. back. I can't see who it is. Oh, hi. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm from the other college. I have a quick question about external uh, evaluators. Yes, thank you. 
Um, how external is external? Meaning, like, out, outside of your department, you still live in the union, outside of like, everything, outside of the university? Oh, do you want to address yeah, that one? Okay. Yes, yeah, yeah. I was going to ask, I mentioned that after. The, word, the term external evaluators has not been applicable to us since 2008 when Steve Cotton went with them on the Justin Act. That came from the faculty. If you, our current, the current factors for you can say additional, uh, additional evaluators, specifically so we don't have to create the fiction that years ago we used to do by saying, does that mean outside of your department, outside of yeah. college? For faculty, it's external. For us, it's, it's additional. And so the things that you want to look at are somebody who can judge you on the work or the professional achievement of your service, which may be in your college, it may be in the university, maybe outside, but somebody who's not so close that partnered with them and so there's a sense that there may be a perception of that by. So those two things, if those two things are met, that's the appropriate for the additional factors. So that's been, it's been changed, although you may find that depending on where you are in the university, there's a lot of old copies of things going around that administrators still have or old departments have not been like we saw one recently in this cycle uh, from the library school uh, from the summary center still evaluators. It is additional evaluators and it was specifically changed so that we don't have to Confused with faculty, with the faculty requirement, right? And see, the, the faculty, yeah. And what I was going to say is, okay. So Cheryl and I worked together on professional um, organizations, but we don't, we, can, we we see each other in meetings. We've been involved in working on different projects outside of our colleges, or our area. So she would be somebody that I could use as an additional. Evaluator, whereas a, like a program director within my college may be someone I would use as just you know an evaluator. They, no, they count, that counts as employees. That counts okay. as employees. That's the distinction that we. That that's both of those are appropriate as additional. It's additional to okay. the peer review and your dean's letters. Okay. So it doesn't mean right. you have to have certain evaluators that are. It's only for evaluators. Okay. Only minimum of four. You can have more, but there are, there's no in, internal external distinction to be made. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Heather. Now we'll now we will hear from Gail McCready on uh, things to keep in mind for the division or department level. And I'm a nerd, so I'm going to use PowerPoint. Just <laughs> wait. Yeah, just after lunch, man. So here we go. Okay. Um, I was asked to speak on the college level uh, committee view of what we're looking at in terms of your packets when we're looking at promotion uh, movement. Um, I'm currently an academic advisor too. Obviously I'm a lifer here because I've also been all of those things um, over time. I'm in the weird position of having gone up for promotion with a packet and having to do the same level again in a couple of years. So, it's kind of odd. <laughs> My life isn't in a straight line. Um, what I was trying to think of is what one thing, if I had to say there was one most important thing you need to know about promotion, I would say it's your factors. And yeah, I know, it's an AAUPASSE meeting. So obviously the contract is foremost. But the reality is until you know what the various levels within your rank are, you're not going to know what you need to do to move up. After that, you really need to know about the process and the timeline I think is the most important. In class, the deans send out to chairs and directors an email right about now that says, who do you think is going to be up for the fall? So you need to be letting your supervisor know now that you intend to go up in the fall if that's when you're looking at your own promotion timeline. Um, the other thing to know is does your unit have an internal committee? Some uh, departments or, or units have enough people that you have an internal committee as well as the college committee as well as the university committee. So that's a good piece to know whether your supervisor sends it direct to the college. Um, the other more touchy issue 
is how long has your supervisor been in their rank, and how well do they understand the process. <laughs> There's nothing more deadly than coming up for promotion with somebody who doesn't understand what needs to happen. So it's probably good to take a look at how long they've been in rank to know how much they know about academic staff promotion. And do not assume that a faculty member knows about academic staff promotion. They know about faculty promotion. Um, and then uh, for the second thing, I thought, what is the most confusing thing? And I think the thing that gets overlooked a bit is that, and obviously she's right, your job performance is the number one always. But promotion is about your whole career and not just your job. Um, so during the course of your, right now you're in a specific job with a specific title, in a unit, you know what you're supposed to be doing for a living, you have a specific supervisor, that's right now. And that may continue for after your promotion. But your career, you can do a lot of different things at various institutions. If you have a national arc to your career, you may be at five different institutions along the way. So you have to think about your career as multiple titles, multiple institutions, how many different responsibilities have you held, and how many different supervisors have you had to work with. For me, as an academic advisor in a specific department, I may be given the, the instruction that I'm supposed to help increase student retention. As a career as an academic advisor, this, there's a step back in terms of keeping up with the research and best practices as academic advisors in the profession <coughs> and how you can impact as an advisor student retention. So there's sometimes a disparity between those two in terms of what your department understands your role is as a student retention person and actually what your career entails. So just be aware as you evolve in your career that the theory and development stuff you're looking at is as an advisor. It, I'm in history. People assume that I know a ton about history. I know some about history. <laughs> I like history. I don't teach history. I haven't taken a history course in a million years. That's not where my expertise lies. And people get confused about, in my professional development, am I supposed to be learning more about the unit I'm in and its discipline as opposed to the discipline of being an academic advisor? Which is why I think you need to think about your professional arc as you think about promotion. Think of it as the line of progression from your first job to the last job you have before you retire. One hopes that that's an upward arc of skills and responsibilities and promotions and wonderful things. I have seen arcs that are a little more like this. Try not to do that. <laughs> and yeah, I know, I take that as somebody who just took a step backward, but there are reasons. So when you're a one, um, you were hired in as a one about, and that hire was about all of the wonderful things that you showed potential for. A one is about mastering your job and starting to move out into the community, but the big thing is developing excellence in your job performance. Do try to go above and beyond in your job. And remember that when you get out of your office for professional development as a one, you probably only have to go as far as the campus. We want to see you getting out of your office, but you don't have to travel much. When you're a two, <laughs> yeah, it's all song titles. Um, when you're a two, uh, obviously the first thing is you need a master's. Um, <coughs> You can show your job excellence as a one, so 
as a two, you need to be moving beyond just doing your job. So you need to think about how you're going to be a productive, productive member of the unit, how you fit into their goal structure, and how you support um, advancing the unit's goals. In professional achievement, you should be starting to move from only attending on-campus events to maybe presenting on campus or attending at the regional level. You're starting to move toward regional leadership. Um, in service, if you look at your VITA and the way that it lists the, the under service, the committee listings, you'll see that it says chairs before it says membership. And you'll see it says university before college and before department. Take that ranking seriously because that is how people tend to prioritize them. If you're a chair, it weighs more than if you're a member. If you're a chair of a university level committee, it counts more than if you're a member. So as the personnel committees are looking at that structure, they're going to be trying to see that you're taking leadership in various arenas. For three, um, yeah, you're doing everything you used to do and. And now we're starting to look at the cumulative record of achievement over time. Um, the two to the three jump, you especially need to be aware that the committee is going to be aware of folk who have taken the previous 18 months to join everything in the universe possible to fill in their data <laughs> and that they intend to drop off all of those as soon as they get to be a three. They want to look at your career achievement. So they're going to be looking at the baby steps all the way up to now. Um, there is a certain bias in the college committees uh, against people who have only been active for six months. Um, you should be starting to branch out looking at local or regional conferences or other leadership opportunities that are, so that you're becoming known in your area. This is an arc for you as a professional, academic professional, not in your department professional. Your job has to keep expanding, moving, showing more responsibility, showing you as an innovator. But um, you should be moving into university level service. As you become more experienced, you should be starting to give back as a mentor. Um, Just everything in the world. <laughs> um, as a four, <laughs> the last one was We Might Be Giants, but uh, th three in a song title is kind of a thin thing. Um, yeah. You're at the top of your game when you're a four. So as you prepare for promotion from a three to a four, you got to understand that people are going to be looking for at least some of those pieces before you get there. Um, I, I put the note in here, at Wayne State, lots of people top out as the three because they end up with a university career as opposed to a national career, like me. Um, so a three, at a three, you're doing everything in the universe, but you might not have made that jump to presenting your own research doing your own grants, doing your own presentations at a national level. Um, whatever you've done on your way to the floor, you expect to be held to a standard that places you head and shoulders above the next guy. Um, so every time you move forward, you have to think about the fact that the committee is looking for everything that's in your current rank plus some measure of stuff that's in the next rank. So in a weird way, before you go up for promotion, you're kind of doing the next snip of bit of the next rank because they want to see that you have the potential to do that. Yes, it's totally unfair, but it, ha it is how it works. So once you have in your mind that sense of job performance and professional arc, you can take a look at your VITA, which actually mirrors those three parts that you're going to be weighed on. Job performance is always, always, always the heaviest, by far. 
Um, when you're putting together your vita, there's an area of your job responsibility. Make sure that's A, accurate, and B, understandable. If I don't work with you, and I don't know what you do for a living, and you put in highly technical jargon uh, that's pertinent to your department, but not understandable to me, that's going to make me grouchy in committee. I mean, that's just a reality. That everybody on the outside of your unit has to be able to do, but understand what you're doing on the inside. So find a way to explain what you do in a way that non-technicians can understand. Um, make sure um, if you've done anything that's really stellar, and people will forget this all the time, find a place to put that in your vita, not just in your personal statement. Because if it's not in your vita, they're going to wonder why. And people forget to do that all the time. For professional achievement, this is more of the career stuff. This is what are you doing to advance yourself as a professional. So it's going to, it might be from one to a two that advanced degree. It could be conferences you've attended or presented at, seminars, webinars, all the things we do here, all your research. That goes into your professional achievement area. Service carries the lightest weight, but it can sometimes make a difference when the committee is looking at your record. Um, and that's because we need to see that you're moving beyond your job to be a whole person as a professional. So um, there are a lot of people who stay in their department that have an excellent job. They may well get promoted, but they won't get the subsequent ones unless they move out of their office, at least to some degree. Um, and also in service, remember that we're looking for service that speaks to you as a professional. I am thrilled if you are a volunteer at your kid's school, but this is not the place to work. <laughs> I am thrilled if you are active in something in your neighborhood. What I want to know is how you as a professional use those tools to serve the broader community. It's not just about being in service, it's about being a professional in service. Um, one of those sticky things about going up for promo is your first level recommender is your supervisor. If you are in the middle of some serious arguments with your supervisor, it's unlikely they're going to support you for a promo. And they may or they may not tell you that to your face. So if you know that there's tension, think about the timing of going forward because you absolutely positively have to have their support. It gets tricky. And I have seen people move to a different department before they go up just on the basis of not being able to get adequate support. Um, while you're filling in your job performance and your professional <laughs> achievement and your service, you should be thinking about who then might be able to write you a letter of recommendation later. Who might be able to evaluate your record later. If you say, um, I was everything to Mia Kata, and nobody from Mia Kata writes a letter of eval, I want to know why. Um, if, if you are saying you worked with whoever, you helped uh, develop degree works with Chris, and you don't have that anywhere, and he... And in your packet, you, you go on and on about how great you did work on degree works, and it doesn't show up in a letter of eval. I'm going to wonder why. The, there should be some sort of continuity between the things that you say you're excelling in and involved in and the people that are writing for you. So, get your Vita in order. 
make sure, make sure, make sure that everything is readable and understandable by somebody who doesn't know what you do for a living. Obviously, be the best ever at your job. We all do that every day. Um, know your factors. Um, in a crowded calendar, remember to put your professional development in your to-do list. Um, close to the top, please, because otherwise you'll never get out of your office. And if you never get out of your office, you'll never collect the sort of experiences you need to be promoted. Um, get commit connected to the university committee. There, there are tons of people in this community that can help you. Uh, as a group, academic staff are very generous with time and effort and will help you along the way. And, you know, start to make connections to the wider community and your profession. Remember, your profession is as academic staff, not your unit representative. You do both, but it's bigger than that. And once you think you have that in hand, go for it. <laughs> about you were saying make sure you have um, if you felt you did something stellar make sure you have it in your record try to put it in your record and your personal statement both now when you go up for promotion would you put your entire record in there or would it be the last five years for promotion I'd advise putting everything in the can because you put, can you it's put cumulative you're looking at a cumulative view of your career, you're not looking like selective salary at the last three years with one year highlighted. Mm -hmm. You're looking at your whole career. So I would put everything out there unless it no longer speaks to the position you're in. So you can't put the whole record, not just the last five years. I have multiple videos. I have. Uh, he's got an opinion that's only going to say seven years, right? No. Oh, what it's the, 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 the professional records is fine, but I also, but it depends. That's one of those ones, as you get many, many more years, those of us who have more than a decade or more than a decade. Mm -hmm. then it, at that point, it does go in chaos. So your point about is there is it still left. So yeah. It should I mean, be. nobody cares. Five the, years, but it goes out. Yeah. Nobody cares I was a volunteer at some event in 87. Right. Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> it was a I question. Do. But I do. Um, <laughs> Um, you talk about letters and recommendation. How many letters should a typical package include? And then you talk about the it's four, right? minimum, four. Okay. minimum of four additional. Because your dean writes one and your chair or supervisor writes one. Mm -hmm. And the committee writes and everybody writes. But there's four additionals. How many people should we um, be asking? Or what's the process of asking someone? And do we, I mean, how does that go? I think different units handle it differently. What you want to avoid is somebody being called up blind, particularly if they're in the university, by your supervisor for a rec. Um, the verbiage on the provost website parallels faculty really closely on this point, in that you supply a list to your supervisor and they select off that list who they want to have as, uh, as an additional evaluator. My experience has been you give them a list of people that have already sort of said that they would write for you, and then your supervisor tricks off of the list that you've kind of like pre-done. So you talk to the people ahead of time just to kind of... Yeah, I would give them some heads up that you're hoping that they would write for you, because what happens if you put it on your list and, and they don't like you as much as you think? You know, you want to be sure that they're willing to write for you. Yes. How recently do they have to have? I think, for example, I've served on committees. I've had chairs, but it's been a couple of years. Like I'm still involved in the committee, but obviously the chairs change every year. So how recently do they have to have been the chair? Does that make sense? I guess the letter needs to be current. Right, but the, the relationship can be. The relationship is a little more wishy-washy, but you want because you're talking about. <laughs> your whole career, it could have a little age on it since they've known you, but I wouldn't go back, you know, 10 years to get somebody. Right, okay. <laughs> um, they, you, you 
kind of want somebody who knows what you're doing and what you're capable of now. Okay, can we hold, uh, if there are any other questions, uh, please hold them to the end because we do have another presenter. So now I'll turn it over to Chris. Hello. <laughs> so my job today is to kind of demystify what happens at the university level, um, promotion and tenure committee for academic staff. And I was asked to address two specific things, the timeline for the PT committee and the process that the committee goes through. So for those of you that don't know, um, the PT committee is addressed in Article 30. Um, there are other committees that are also addressed as the university-wide committee's article. Um, nominations, a request for nominations is sent out. Um, it has to be sent out by the end of winter semester. I think most units send that out like August, September, um, just to get people thinking about it and then provide the deadline. You are completely within your rights to nominate yourself. Um, for any of those committees. To serve on P&T, you have to have ESS or tenure. That is the only caveat. Um, in terms of who ends up being selected for the committee, that decision is made by the Academic Senate Policy Committee and the Provost. Um, so it's not your dean or director or chair. It's much higher up the, the food chain of the university. Um, I will say that although it's not specifically stated as a requirement, it's been my experience that the members of the committee have been um, either at or near the top of rank. So it's very unlikely that you're going to see an ASL1 serving on that committee, for example. Um, the purpose is to have people that have a lot of experience um, conducting these evaluations. Um, so you want somebody that knows the factors, knows what they're talking about, um, has been through it, um, so that's why it's usually um, senior academic staff members. In terms of the process, the committee meets um, in April, usually, um, two weeks or so before, if all emails go out when they're supposed to go out, <laughs> uh, and the night before in my case, um, two weeks before the provost office sends out all the packets, they are sent out electronically because we all have to turn them in electronically now. Um, for those of you that remember the binders that we used to have to carry around campus, um, the electronic version is much nicer. <laughs> um, my first year on the committee, I had 19 binders that I had to schlep around campus. It was not fun. So we get down about two weeks before. It is our job to evaluate each and every packet on our own, and then we come together as a committee. We talk about each packet one by one, um, and then there's a vote on whether or not the committee feels the promotion should go forward. Um, usually it, it only takes one meeting. Um, I think I've only been on it once where we had to have two meetings just because there were so many people going up that year, but usually it can be handled in one. It's not a short meeting, but it, it, it is one technically one meeting. Um, generally speaking, by the time packets get to the university level, they have already been through multiple layers of review. So it's pretty rare for us to see a packet that isn't deserving to be there. Um, there's been, you know, a couple like weird instances where like a letter was left out or there was a new dean that really wasn't aware of the process and you know, things like that. So, I mean, those things are noted, and, you know, it's a provost, you know, job to go back and, you know, talk to individuals and make sure that, you know, everything is included and, you know, this is actually what you should write in your letter if you're the dean, you know, things like that. But those aren't things that are ever held against the person applying for promotion. Um, if your dean writes a letter that says you're the worst worker on earth, that would be a problem, though. So, I mean, generally... <laughs> Good letters from your administrators are what we're looking for. Um, there are occasions where promotions have been denied. Um, it's not a pleasant thing to go through um, on the committee. It's a very difficult decision. Um, it has been my experience that that happens for one of three reasons. Either the individual did not fulfill their factors, they did not have enough time and rank, 
or there was something presented in the packet that was questionable, either known to be inaccurate or maybe the dates were a little off and somebody tried to include things that they really shouldn't have. Um, so I definitely recommend being as accurate and honest um, when recording your information as possible. Um, there's lots of tools that you can use through Pipeline, your colleagues, to try and you know figure out when you attended something. You know everybody has an online program these days, so you can you know verify through various ways um, the dates that you attended something. Other recommendations that I would make: um, make sure you read and understand your factors. That is the most important thing you can do. Because if there is ever any question at the university level, we are going to go back to the factors. And indeed, this year we did. Um, if you do not have factors, please call the union office and they will help you either locate them, because you might have them and just don't know where they are, or they will help you figure out what guidelines you're supposed to be using um, when you're looking at your packet and what your responsibilities are. It's going to be pretty rare where there isn't any documentation of any sort that is out there you know, to help you um, with your job. Hmm? University packets and job description, and they will. Thank you, Ricardo. Can you say that louder? If you don't have factors, and many of us still don't, the university and the content, the university factors are available, um, and they're, they're very general, but they, they touch on different areas, and then there are specific job descriptions. So that's contractually, that's permitted, and that's what you use, but you can, again, you know, this is a call to have somebody help guide you to that, make sure somebody's working with you, but that's. Um, and we're trying to get factors everywhere. It's been going on for about 10 years. But if you're coming up with a motion this year, you don't have factors, university factors in your job description, and make sure you work with somebody to see how it fits. Um, make sure that the packet that you submit is complete. Um, make sure that your packet has a cover sheet. Um, the provost office doesn't like packets, they don't have cover sheets. Um, that cover sheet lists everything that is supposed to be within your packet and things are supposed to be checked off to verify that they're in there. So make sure that you have that cover sheet. It's a little confusing when we're flying through these packets if we, you know, all of a sudden open one and we're like, where's the cover sheet? And then you look through the whole thing and you're like, oh, they don't have one. So make sure you have a cover sheet. Have at least one person, re at least one person, review your packet before you submit it <coughs> to anybody. Um, have somebody from your, you know, EPT committee, if possible, a senior staff member, um, someone that can tell you, look, this is how we do things here, and this needs to be moved into this place. Um, having another set of eyes is really important. Having a set of eyes that don't belong to your rank or classification is helpful. Um, I am an archivist. How many people in this room know what I do? <laughs> Not very many. So I always try to run my language by someone who isn't an archivist so that they can say, yeah, this is not in English. <laughs> you need to explain this a little better. Because I don't want the person, you know, reading my packet, you know, usually at home two days before the committee meeting, trying to figure out what it is that I do. And by then it's too late for anybody to ask any questions. So it's, it's really important that you explain, as Heather said, um, explain what you do in simple and clear language um, in your personal statement. Um, please do not include a million pages of supporting material. We're not going to look at it. Um, one example for each type of thing that <coughs> would be like a professional service um, activity or a conference that you presented at. Just one example of those things is really all you need to include. This notion that you have to have a piece of paper to prove that you were <coughs> at all of these events is not well received at the university level. We have had packets where there have been in excess of 200 pages of 
supporting material. Mm-hmm. Nobody has time for that. Mm-hmm. So, and we're not going to look at it. So you're wasting your time gathering all that together when you could maybe be spending some more time focusing on the nuts and bolts of the data that's in your in your packet. So limit yourself, please. Can you give us an estimate of how long it should be? Depending on your rank, um, I would say if you have more than 50 pages, there's problems. And, and so, I mean, because, like, programs can be five or six pages all by themselves. But, you know, you don't need to scan every single thank you note you've ever received. You don't need to scan every program for every one of these you've ever attended. Um, it's just not necessary. So keep that in mind. If you have questions about what you think you should include, send me an email. I would be more than happy to help you. Talk to somebody in your unit that's done this before. And, I mean, they, they find out after the fact that they didn't need to put all that stuff in. But they're probably not going to tell you that unless you ask them. <laughs> because they had to do all that work. They want you to do all that work, too. You had a question? How much of the professional statement you write your Does that go on for a while? Yeah, definitely not too long. But I can tell you that that is definitely a unit-by-unit unit thing. Um, because I have having worked for two different administrative sections now, one of them wanted a 10-page personal statement and the other one wanted a two-page personal statement. So that's something that you're going to have to determine within your unit. Does anybody else have questions about the university process? I was just going to add a couple little things. Just maybe know this already. So when you get promoted by contract, you get five percent pages. So it's, uh, it's worth it to do it. And um, let's see, I don't know if anyone went through sort of the lower level, like how people are picked me on the committees in their uh, colleges or divisions to, to do that. Who are on this? Because I don't think anybody, you know, they're elected by their peers to be on these committees. Uh, or sometimes beg by their committees. <laughs> <laughs> And that it requires a two-third vote in order to get a Senate majority vote. It's a two-third vote. So it has to be um, a little bit more. I also wanted to mention that there's also often college factors, not just university factors, um, uh, sometimes unit factors, depending on the unit. Because a lot of times, well, back then the staff, there's only a couple of units, so they, you know, that's what we have to rely on the um, There is an appeal process you were denied, but it's more about reconsideration. Um, and, and, uh, it, uh, it's hard to do, and you and you have to be in rank and you have to be eight, eight years. To yeah, if you go for the university, yeah, so, yeah. Yes, it's right. right. But it's, so there is some language on which we'll get at least getting a reconsideration at some point. Um, that basically has to be the same people to reconsider. So it uh, <clears throat> may not be the you know the, uh, the answer to your problem for your um, so most people are not and, and sometimes when they are they go off the next year and then they're successful. So they work out whatever needs to be worked out and are successful. So that was so depending on how many people there are on the university committee, how many people that are being reviewed at the university committee level, the letters go out either the end of April or the beginning of May. You're not going to see that money in your paycheck until September. <laughs> um, so, and nothing can be done about that. <laughs> it's just how it works. It's for the next day. Yeah. I just want to say to everybody um, thinking about going out for promotion, when you're doing your uh, professional statement, you're not just making, uh, like writing about everything that's in your visa. You're trying to more explain about kind of who you are and what you're trying to do, you're trying to do what everybody's talking about up here, show that you show the justification of why you are above rank and how you're deserving of this higher level. But you're also trying to weave together a story of sort of like your philosophy and kind of how 
you know, why you did this, why you did that, but you're, just don't, the, don't just list everything that's in your email. Right. You know, you're trying to more kind of write uh, kind of who you are, or what you're trying to do, and why you're trying to do this, and how you deserve your place. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, it's a good place to see. <coughs> and if you're not, if you're not good with that, try to work with someone and, you know, get some guidance. You're remarking yourself. You know, think of your, you know, we all know the resume you mark yourself. And sometimes we're not oriented to do that, but you sort of have to get with a program and get that way and say, you know, why do I want to do this? And you got to put that in writing. Yes, um, let me just add with that because I was very thankful at the time when I went up for promotion that there was someone in my unit who really uh, helped me because that is a hard part because sometimes it's hard to sell ourselves. But if one thing that I can add, I have served on the university uh, by uh, PNT committee. But one of the things that which uh, I learned as my years here at Wayne State the university committee is also looking for quantifiable information. For example, don't just say, well, I help advise students. Say how many students. Say how many average a quarter. Things like that. Because, and also, maybe perhaps saying when you first started, you only saw this many students, you should show a progression. But just to kind of summarize what all of our presenters have said, first of all, let's give them a hand for <laughs> They all said very important things. Some key points to definitely remember, uh, I can't say it reiterate enough what Kristen said, have another person, even somebody who doesn't know what in the heck you do, because if they can understand what you're writing, what your job is, that would be very helpful. Again, with uh, Gail reiterated about things have to match. You know, if you say you've done this, that, and the other for an organization, but you don't have a letter from that organization, that raises red flags. The key thing is, and I cannot address enough, emphasize enough, start early. Again, this is why we are having this session now, because over the summer, which may, it depends on which unit you're in, and my unit it is a little slower in the summer, this is the time now to start doing it, because we know, all know how far it is. The beginning gets busy. And when those deadlines come, it'll be here before you know it. Not to say try to put it all together at one time, but start working gradually, gradually, gradually. Any final last minute questions before we leave? First of all, again, thank you all. And then, Gail. I forgot to say one important thing in terms of preparing for going off. Everybody, if you don't already have it, you should have a file somewhere. Yes. And every time you do something, throw it in the file. Even if this today. I don't care if it's an email, a program, what it is. Because, uh, you know, life is busy and we don't update our Vitas every three minutes necessarily. And you'll forget you did something six months ago that could be important. So if you don't already have a file going, get one going right now. And, and I always want to say, universe, um, service to the union it counts as professional university service. So if you were to become nominated um, or nominate yourself, nominate someone, and you can work on the committee that is considered service. <clears throat> Everyone, please fill out the blue sheet, which is the evaluation. We do take your comments.